Hello, welcome back. This is lesson five of the Word Gross Multiplying Disciples course. I'm Pastor Peter from Sweden, and thank you for joining me for the first section of the lesson. It is my privilege to be with you once again as we learn how God's Word grows and disciples multiply. Think about this. Albert Einstein is considered to have one of the greatest scientific minds of our time. To this day, more than 60 years after his death, Einstein's name is synonymous with genius. In fact, even though he was a German man of Jewish descent who lived most of his life in Switzerland and the United States, he's well known worldwide. A quick internet search lists many academic institutions named after him across the globe. It's especially interesting that Einstein has schools named after him, because early in life, he was not considered a high achiever or a model student. When he was two years old, his parents consulted a doctor because he wasn't talking. When he was 16, he failed an entrance exam into a new school. For most of his childhood and adolescence, Einstein struggled to relate to both fellow students and teachers. Despite what might be considered a slow start, however, Einstein grew to become perhaps the greatest scientist in the history of the world. He unlocked previously unknown secrets about the order and working of God's creation. In our last lesson, we looked at the story of a young man named Mark. God blessed Mark by allowing him to hear the good news of Jesus, his Savior, from a young age. He also had the benefit of being asked by Paul and Barnabas to join them on their first missionary journey. Despite the advantages he enjoyed, however, Mark displayed spiritual immaturity. When the journey became difficult, he abandoned his co-workers. Mark's abandonment hurt the work and offended at least one of his companions. Paul had no interest in allowing Mark to join him on his next journey. Barnabas, though, continued to work with young Mark and took him along as he once again encouraged the churches in Cyprus. The book of Acts, from this point, continues with the story of Paul. We do not learn any more details about Mark for some time. Then, suddenly, Mark reappears. Approximately 12 years later, it is Paul himself who mentions Mark. At the end of Paul's letter to the Colossians, we find out that Mark is once again working with Paul. Paul asks the Colossian Christians to welcome him. Then, in his letter to Philemon, Paul calls Mark his co-worker. And most amazingly, several years later, as Paul sat in his dark dungeon awaiting his execution, Paul asks Timothy to find Mark and bring him there so that Paul could speak to him, in Paul's words, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. Found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. What changed Mark from a young, immature man who failed in his first attempt as a missionary to someone Paul considered essential to his own ministry? Mark's change is the fruit of Barnabas' patient encouragement. It is the result of God's word and the fulfillment of the promises of God. We too should not dismiss a potential disciple or leader too quickly because of spiritual immaturity or sin. Everyone is a sinner. Paul and Mark were sinners, yet God still used Mark to spread the gospel. God can use people in our own groups to do the same. What does God want us to do when we come across signs of weakness or sin in a fellow Christian? We find the answer in the letters to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 5, we learn about a member of the church who was involved with sexual immorality. Paul writes, Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. 
But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Paul encourages the church members to take loving action in order to save his soul. They were to point out his sin and call him to repentance. 2 Corinthians 2 also says, Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Treating each other in love, including pointing out sin and forgiving sin, is how a Christian should live and how a church or group functions best. By doing these things, it's important to continue to teach the saving gospel message to others. As you encourage disciples, those disciples will encourage others, and so on, creating more links in the chain of disciples. May God bless you as you proclaim His law and gospel. I'm Pastor Peter. Thank you for joining me. Please continue your tell study in the live section of class. God bless.